Good morning to everyone. Before I preach, I made a promise last week that uh, we were going to do something really special today. So I want to start my sermon with that. If you were here last week, I announced to you that as a part of our 2020 vision, we had uh, been able to accomplish paying off all of our debt. Uh, just, if you weren't here last week, let me just remind you real quick. The 2020 vision was all about trying to reach people. We, did this, we started this a year ago by funding four campuses, eliminating the debt we had on the Elyria campus that we got in 1991, do the math, renovating four campuses, doing all this in four years. So our, our goal was to pay off the, this debt by the end of 2017. And I told you, if you were here last week, I told you we did it four and a half years early. So as of, of May 2nd, this past Tuesday, we made our last payment on that loan. We are now debt free from that. <laughs> Woo! That's right. So we've arranged to have a few people who represent you. So we've got some people who are actually here in 1991 who have been paying, and this represents a, a number of you, been paying on that note all the way since 1991. Incredible faithfulness. And those of you who have come since then and have been started paying on that, as well as those who just last year started. So we've invited them to come. If you guys will come, and they're going to help me. They're bringing the copy of the mortgage note. We're going to light this puppy on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys. You represent the faithfulness of many people in our church. You represent the, the sacrifice and the commitment of so many of you. So let's, let's burn this thing and have some fun. Yeah. Now they say this is not going to blow up in my face. We'll see. <laughs> now let's celebrate. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Be gone. <laughs> That's cool. Thanks, you guys. It is so exciting to, uh, to do that and to be a part of that as the fire burns. There we go. Anybody got some hamburgers? No. I was just kidding. Someone's bringing a hamburger. No. Uh, this is this such an exciting day, and uh, we're so grateful for all that God has done. And so let me just say again, thank you to all of you who are giving for so long. You didn't think this day was going to come, did you? Isn't that great? Now, fire uh, is often a symbol in the Bible for the presence of God. Now, not that we need fire, you know, here to burn, to, present, to represent God, but if you read your Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, oftentimes you'll see fire representing the presence of God. Now, again, not every time, but think about when the Egyptians or when the Israelites were, were brought out of Egypt. Remember how there was a pillar of fire that led them out? That would represent, represented the presence of God. And by day there was this big pillar. And um, when they would meet in the tabernacle, God would oftentimes just bring fire from heaven and it would just burn up the sacrifices. In the temple, when they finally built the temple, when they dedicated, again, fire from heaven came this just had to be an incredible sight. And, and God said, well, uh, there's a fire burning down the temple. Don't let that fire go out. Now, why would that be? Why would God instruct them to not let the fire go out in the temple? Because it represented God's continual presence. That that fire is, is God's presence, not exactly, but representing. And so to let that fire go out was kind of a way of saying, well, God's left. So they, they kept the fire burning. And so wherever you went to the temple, fire. Wherever you got near the temple, you could smell the smoke. You could smell the, it was a presence, a, a reminder. Now, the apostle Paul uses that imagery in the New Testament and says, you know, we don't, we don't have a temple building anymore. Now you, the body of believers, Christians, you are the temple of God. So the only way you know this. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God's fire is to burn in you. The presence of the Holy Spirit, he is to burn in us as a, as a picture of the presence of God filling individual believers. But 
Fire goes out. Have you noticed that? Fire doesn't just keep burning. You have to keep you know, fueling it. You've got to keep stoking it. Uh, probably three or four months ago, I was, it was on a Saturday night in our house, and every house I've ever had uh, that I've ever bought we, it has to have a fireplace. And my kids think it's because I'm a pyromaniac, but it's, I'm biblical. It's, that's what it is. I, I'm just trying to be biblical. So we, we have a fire burning a lot of times. And on this Saturday night, about three months ago, I made this roaring fire. And uh, we had the kids over, you know, because we're grown up and get older now. And our kids don't live with us, all of them. So they were over there playing a game in the living room. And I had to go downstairs because this is what I do every Saturday night. I go downstairs and I, I pull out my sermon manuscript and I pray over it. I pray through it, and I, I, I kind of get that fire burning again on a Saturday night, and I may, maybe make some, make some tweaks, and by the time I come up after that, you know, maybe two or three hours, I'm on fire, man. I'm just, whoo, I can't ready for Sunday morning. I'm just stoked, and this particular night, I came up, and the fire in the, in the living room was out. Everybody's there, and I'm like, guys, how could this happen? What, what, what happened here? Well, they were so excited about the game they were playing and so dialed in on that that they kind of ignored the fire, and it just went out. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a great metaphor for so many of us. If you don't pay attention to the fire, it goes out. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but the truth is that in each one of our campuses, and anyone hearing my voice, there's a good chance that either now or sometime in your life, honestly, the fire of God has died down. Maybe you're here today, and everybody else was worshiping. You just thought, man, I'm just going through the motions. Or, or maybe today you felt the fire was reignited in you. But the fire goes out, doesn't it? This is the nature of fire. And what we want to do is, is reignite that fire. Now, two years ago, we started a, a series called Igniting Prayer. So we were, not, we were talking about more than just the passion of God, more than just the presence of God. This was focusing in on prayer. And again, prayer sometimes is, pictures, is pictured by fire. And so um, we were praying through and preaching through the Lord's Prayer where after, Jesus, after the disciples said, Jesus, teach us. We don't know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. So we asked God to help each one of us learn how to pray, to take the next step in prayer, to go deeper so that every one of us could grow in our prayer life. And I got so many comments from this series, so many people feeling like, man, prayer's been ignited in my life. But that was two years ago. <laughs> and since then, the fire has gone out for some of us. The, the fire, the passion of prayer. And for some people, we're back down again to that prayer is just boring. I don't think God even hears me. It's, I don't have the words to say. It's just not working. I, I, I just, that's not for me. So in our re-series, you know, we talked about the resurrection. We got to restart. In our re-series now, today I want to talk about reigniting this passion for prayer. And to answer the question, how do you reignite praying that's died out in your life? You used to be on fire for God. When you'd go to a prayer meeting or get up in the morning and have prayer, you just couldn't wait to talk to God and your prayers were on fire, but that fire has died out. And again, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but I, I think we might be surprised by how many people here this morning who might just say, honestly, I, um, my heart's not on fire. Prayer is not a, a fiery thing for me. I just feel like I'm going through the motions. I, I, it's not working for me. So this, this sermon is for so many of us who want to know, how do I reignite that fire for prayer that's, that's gone out? And what I would say to you, if, like, if you and I were in a one-on-one -on -one discipleship uh, relationship and you came to me with this question, what I'm going to preach is what I would say to you individually. Or if you came because uh, you know, I'm your pastor and you said, Pastor, I just want to talk to you about how do I reignite prayer in my life? This is the advice I would give you. I'd give you four or five you know, things to think about and then send you on your way. So I'm going to give that one-on-one -on -one discipleship lesson or that, that pastoral counseling lesson to all of us now. And the first thing I would say to you is to open the prayer book. Open the prayer book. And I know some of you are like, what? The prayer, is this like a Catholic church? I, I didn't, didn't look like a Catholic church. Is this an Episcopalian church? What, what prayer book are you talking about? There's not a prayer book in the pew in front of you or the chairs in front of you. What do you mean by a prayer book? And so let, let me just say to those of you who are, 
who are familiar with what a prayer book is and those of you who have no idea, it can be a great thing to read a prayer that somebody else has written. Sometimes we just don't have the words to say. Could be that you've been praying all your life, but you kind of get into a rut. Or it could be that you don't even know how to pray. And reading a prayer from a prayer book, it doesn't have to be boring, you guys. It doesn't have to be a ritual. It doesn't have to be empty. It can be something that is very enlivening. In fact, um, it was two weeks ago, I took our, our leadership team, our SAT, on a planning retreat and we were having a great time of prayer, just seeking God. It was just this wonderful moment. And Brian Patchinger, our pastor of our Avon Lake campus, read a prayer from a prayer book that was so awesome. I, I just don't think anyone could have prayed in that moment a prayer that it would have been more meaningful, more powerful. And it was something that somebody had read, written years before, but it just hit us, and it was, a, it was a prayer of repentance, a prayer of, of opening our life to, cry, to God, and just the words were just so chiseled. And I'm not a guy that regularly uses a, a, you know, the Book of Common Prayer. I've done that before, but that moment was so rich and so powerful. So if, if you've got an attitude about a prayer book that that's like for people who don't know how to pray or that's something that's not good, I just... I just challenge you, reconsider that. But if you'll notice on the screen or on your notes, I'm not asking you or inviting you to open a prayer book. Just a simple word here. I'm asking you and inviting you to open the prayer book. What, what, would, what, was the, what would that book be? What would that book be? Just say it out. Since I can't talk, maybe you can. The Psalms. Not just the whole Bible, but the Psalms. The Psalms are a book of prayers and sometimes songs that have been composed, that have been written to teach people how to pray. Or they've been written just to express the emotions or the words or, the, or what's inside of me. And uh, so uh, I don't know if you are a person who uses the, the, the devotions that we send out every day, that we send out every week, that are written from the Psalms and then from the New Testament. Did anybody do, use these? Hopefully. Every day there's a reading from the Psalms. Every day there's a reading from the New Testament. And we invite you to, to meditate on that. Because those Psalms, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can give voice to things you're feeling inside. Maybe you're not able to articulate the hurt the, the anger, the frustration, the confusion. You go to the prayer book, the book of Psalms. Friends, this is what people have been doing for thousands of years. Jews, Christians, and they've used the book of the Psalms as a prayer primer to teach people how to pray. In fact, this is to our shame. This is to our shame. Up until about... I don't know, 150, 200 years ago, the average Christian, the typical Christian, regularly prayed through the Psalms on a daily, on a regular basis. That's what every Christian did because that's what Christians have done for centuries. They've used the Psalms to inspire by the Holy Spirit and to be written by the, the, you know, Moses and, and David and Solomon and the sons of Korah to become their words. And it's, it's become a training tool. So real quickly, if you are lonely, pray Psalm 142. If you're, if you're afraid, pray Psalm 56. Anybody memorize the verse from this past week in our memory verse? When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. When you're afraid, pray Psalm 56. You know, here's a whole bunch more. Bam, wow. You know, just if you want to write those down or if you want to go online, I'm, I have our director of, of uh, communications, Ben Folks, put that up online. And by the way, this is just one Psalm you can pray. There's a, a ton that you could pray when you're feeling lonely. There's a bunch that you can pray when you're afraid. It's not just one. But go to the Psalms. If, if the fire has gone out in your prayer life, or if, if, if it's just a feeling of dry, your, your heart is hard and your eyes are dry, your prayers are cold, and you need to have them reignited, I want to invite you to go to the Psalms because this is what you'll be joining with millions, actually millions of people throughout 
Christendom, throughout the history of the church and throughout the history of, of the Bible, you'll be joining those people. Think about this. Every good Jew read the Psalms, prayed the Psalms, everyone. Uh, so when you go to the early church, the apostles, the apostles prayed the Psalms. So when you pray the Psalms, you are praying the prayers of the early apostles. If you think I ever thought about Acts chapter 2, or Acts chapter 1 and 2, when the, the disciples being obedient to Jesus waited together and prayed, and then you read some of the things that they prayed, they're quoting the Psalms. You understand, don't you, that nobody had a pocket Bible in those days. Nobody, nobody had a Bible, period. The Bibles were, the scriptures were in the synagogue or in the temple or, they, they, no, you know, very, very few people, maybe a real rich person might have a copy of a scroll or two, but people didn't carry around the Bible. So how can they quote the Psalms in a prayer meeting? Because they've been praying them for years. They've memorized them. It shaped their very prayers. Now think about this. Jesus, a good Jew, would have prayed the Psalms every day. When you pray the Psalms, you're praying the prayers of Jesus. You want to pray like Jesus? Pray the Psalms. You want your prayers to be you know, the words that Je I mean, this is incredible. We know the words Jesus prayed many times because we know he prayed the Psalms. And once you see this and you start reading through the Gospels, you start seeing again and again, oh, that, that prayer that Jesus just prayed, that's from Psalms, that's from Isaiah. That, that's where Jesus got those words. So, you know, we've been talking about the prayer book. How about if we turn to it? Turn to Psalm 42, and let's open God's word, because that's where I want to take you today, Psalm 42, to reignite, to just give you some lessons about how to reignite praying that has died out. And this is a great psalm. I've actually preached on this psalm before. I'm going to just skim today. I don't have enough time to go through the whole thing. But how about we stand to our feet. We do this to honor God's word. And we'll read through Psalm 42, listening to these great words of prayer. Notice at the very beginning, before you even get to verse 1, this is not a Davidic psalm. This, is, this psalm was written by the sons of Korah. Who's that? Korah was a worship leader. So I don't know, it's two sons, five sons, I forget. But this, his sons got together and they wrote this. This will sound familiar to you. As the deer pants for the stream's water. Ever heard that before? So my soul, listen to this, pants for you. Oh God, my God. My soul thirsts for you, the living God. When can I go and meet with you? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I, listen to this phrase, pour out my soul. That's a good phrase. I remember how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why my soul are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within ye, me? Put your hope in God. He's talking to himself. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast. It's downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon. He's referring to the fact that the Jordan River, which brought life to the nation of Israel, started in the Mount, Mount Hermon and flowed down. So this is, this is a, a source from the heights of Hermon, from, the, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I love that phrase. A prayer to the God of my life. And I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. As my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And you could continue because in the, in the, the oldest manuscripts, it looks like Psalm 42 and 43, 43 actually might have been one psalm. And you can recognize the, the similar themes. In fact, look at verse 5 of Psalm 43. 
Psalm 43, 5, why is my soul, are you so downcast? Well, this sounds familiar. Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Okay, so you may be seated. Let's quickly run through some high points of this psalm. And the first thing I want you to see is when you feel like your prayer life is dry, when it's dying, go to the psalms. The second thing I want you to see is how often in the psalms you see the kind of language that you see in the first couple of verses. Keep your Bible open. Hear this language as the deer pants for streams. This is, this is passionate yearning for God. My soul thirsts for you. And then you get down to verse 4a. I pour out my soul. So that phrase, pour out my soul, it kind of is a representative phrase for somebody who's, who's crying out to God. I just, I just pour out everything within me. I pour out my hurt, my confusion, my anger. I don't try to come up with pretty words. I just pour out what's there inside of me. I cry out to you. That phrase, cry out to God, shows again and again and again in the Psalms. I cry out to you most high. I cry out to you living God. So if you're taking notes, the first thing I would, you know, said is go to the Psalms. Second thing I would say is, is just cry out to God. Don't try to pray pretty prayers. If you try to do that, you probably won't really be praying in an authentic way. The Psalms are full of real, authentic, raw words. Uh, I, and I love in the, in the Hebrew, you can see some of this rawness. You can see some of the slang, some of the language. You're like, whoa, that's got an edge to it. In fact, if you're familiar with the Psalms, you might recognize that that rawness sometimes shows up with some words that you think to yourself, oh my gosh. Or you could say, oh my God, because you know, you're talking to him. What is that doing in the Bible? That's because <laughs> even though you may have studied the, the Bible and the Psalms as a literature in, at college, it's not meant to be a literature book, especially the Psalms. It's meant to be this raw, real crying out to God. Um, one thing you might try is to read the Psalms in the message translation. Have you heard of the message translation? Anybody? Three, four, five. Um, this was written, you know, translated, paraphrased by a pastor. The guy's name is Eugene Peterson, and a longtime pastor at a church in Maryland, and he was trying to teach people how to pray. And he would, in good company with many others, would give them the book of Psalms and say, here, brand new Christian, or here, person whose prayer has died out, pray the Psalms. And they would come back to him and say, Pastor, I... It's the King James or whatever translation arena. It just doesn't work for me. I, I don't, it, doesn't, I don't, it doesn't resonate. I don't get it. And so Pastor Peterson would translate in his own translation a, a psalm and give it to the person and say, pray this. It's faithful to the original Hebrew, and yet it's language that's contemporary today, that's, that's street language or, or slang language that feels more relevant to where you are. Again, if we can get out of praying the prayers of the Old Testament, the, the Psalms, with this thee and thou as if it's some kind of a poetic thing and get down into the nitty-gritty, we'll learn how to pray. Yeah, the Psalms are poetic and they can be beautiful, but their purpose is to be voice prayers. And so people would come back to Pastor Peterson and say, that Psalm came alive with the translation. So he would do another one. And another one. And eventually, he ended up translating the whole book, 150, the whole book of Psalms. And people were like, man, this is so helpful. How about doing some other books from the Old Testament? How about the New Testament? And today, what started as helping people to pray has now become a, a whole Bible of translation, of paraphrase in language that's, that's the language we all use today. So I recommend you to read the Psalms in the Message Translation or the, the New Living Translation just to... To, uh, to let different words shape what you're feeling, what you're thinking, what maybe you don't even know what you're thinking. It, just, it gives you words so that your prayers are meaningful, so that you know what you're praying. Amen? So um, the crying out, the passionate, the, the passion, the, the guttural, deep honesty. Um, <laughs> really, don't try to impress God. Just, just say it. Just, I want to be careful how I'm, how I'm about to say this. 
I was praying with a young believer. Uh, I was still in college, actually. And uh, I was at a church service, and he went down the altar, and I felt like the Lord was calling me to go down there and pray with him. So I prayed with him. And he was so, he was so raw and just become a Christian. And I, I want to be careful. Please don't do this. But multiple times in the prayer, he swore <laughs> because he didn't know how else to talk to God. <laughs> I'm so bleeping excited, God, and I'm so bleeping this, and I'm just like, I'm just a college student. I'm going to be a pastor one day, but my ears are so kind of virgin ears. You know, I expected that stuff on the ports of Boston, but not in a church. But, I mean, if I can say this, his prayers were honest. They were real. They were raw. And I think that, that God prefers that over some, you know, holy roller. Oh, God, who hears us today. I think God's like, whoa, stay away. I, I'm not listening to that. So get real. Get raw. He knows what you're thinking anyway, right? So just, just tell him. That's, that's, that's what he wants. This is what you see in Psalm after Psalm after Psalm, and I love it. It's just so good. Now, another piece of advice. Um, I keep seeing this phrase. Do you see it in verse 4 and then in verse 10, this phrase? People teasing them about where is your God? And as if he's, you know, left him. And uh, notice the, the writer says in verse 2, my soul thirsts for you. Where can I go? When can I go and meet with God? Do you hear what's happening there? They're picturing it as if God resides in a particular place, like a church, like a temple, like a tabernacle, like a holy place, a, holy, a high and holy hill, that if you want to talk to God, you have to go there. Where can I go and meet with God? And people are saying, where is your God? I don't see him. But then he says, then I remember down in verse 6, he says, therefore I will remember you. And go down from verse 6 to verse 8 when he's, he says, by day, he reminding himself now, by day the Lord directs his love. So the Lord's with me by day. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. What he means by that is that my whole life belongs to God. God's presence is with me. In other words, what he is saying is God is not a God who just is here or there, but he is everywhere, and I can practice the presence of God anywhere I'm at. This is going to be good for those of you who think that God dwells in the church or that God only meets you in your devotions. This can bring life to a burned-out, dead prayer life. That is, throughout your day, Practice walking with God. Practice talking to him. He's with you. You don't have to go someplace to meet him. He's with you right where you are. By day, he's with you. By night, this reminds us of a, of a promise that we see in the Bible again and again. Old Testament, New Testament, this kind of words. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I will be with you always. Remember all these phrases? Now, sometimes we feel like God's not with us. Amen? Absolutely. I feel this way sometimes. I don't feel God's presence. But God's presence is not defined about whether I feel him or not. He's always there. Just like in Cleveland, we know whether I can see the clouds, the, the, the sun or not. I know it's there. Lots of clouds. But we don't say, oh my gosh, the sun has disappeared. I hope it comes back someday. We know the clouds are just covering the sun. So God's presence is always with us. Just sometimes the clouds are really thick and we don't feel the warmth of his presence. But practice the presence of God. I love Psalm 89 um, for, for this reason. You're going to turn with me real quickly. Psalm 89, verse 15. <laughs> the psalmist says, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, and this is the part I really like, who walk in the light of your presence. So I've kind of shortened it here. Blessed are those who walk in the light of your presence. I like that because the psalmist is reminding me, again, I don't have to go somewhere to meet God. You can develop the ability, no matter how hard your job is, no matter how many kids under four that you have screaming in your house, no matter where you are, student, uh, you can practice the presence of God and you can learn to be attuned to the presence of God throughout your day. 
Now, I, whenever I say stuff like this, I always get an email or somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor, you don't know what kind of job I have. Well, may, maybe I don't. But it's not based upon the kind of job you have. It's based upon the omnipresence of God. It's not you. It's God. Because he's always present. He's a breath away. So develop the ability to walk with God. Again, I like the word walk because it's not I go to one place and when I walk away, I leave him. Oh, walk, no matter where I walk, God's with me. Talk to him. And if you feel uncomfortable about people seeing you with your lips moving, just, you know, don't worry about it. You're talking to God. You know, bring him into the business decisions that you make. Talk to him about the investment that you're about to make. Talk to him about the business decision you're about to make. Talk to him about the person you're about to hire. Whatever it is that you're talking about, you're thinking about throughout the day, include God. Practice the presence of God. He's there. You just need to practice him. And that, my friends, is prayer. <laughs> that's prayer. When you're talking to God throughout the day, that's prayer. It doesn't have to be in your devotions. It doesn't have to be just at church. You can talk to God all day long. Now, when I put that, that point up there, practicing the presence of God, some of you were like, oh, some of you remember that little book, right? By well, a, a monk named Brother Lawrence called Practicing the Presence of God. It's a tiny little book. You can read it in the afternoon, but don't. It's the kind of book that you should read slowly and think about. Wow. Because what happens with this, this monk is that he you know, is in prayer times all the time. This collect, that prayer time, this prayer time, in solitude, vespers. He's on all these different times of prayer, um, and he did, wanted to do an experiment. Can I talk to God and keep that going all day? When I'm washing dishes in the kitchen, can I talk to God? And he began to practice that and experiment, and he began to sense God's presence with him all day long. Had God been with him before? Yes. He just wasn't practicing the presence. He wasn't aware of it. He wasn't tuned in. And he found that no matter what he did, he did this experiment for many years. No matter what he did, he could talk to God all day through the day, no matter what he was doing. You can do this. And I want to encourage you. Let me put it this way. Stop trying to improve your prayer life. Instead, start living a praying life. That's paraphrased from a guy named Dallas Willard who taught me a lot about prayer. And I don't want to say stop having devotions, but I do want to say include him throughout the day. What's the answer to the question in Psalm 42, verse 2? Where can I go meet with God? Anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. He is always around. Later on, Psalm 139 would be written that says, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the highest heights, you're there. If I go to the lowest depths, you are there. No matter where, the east to the west, no matter where I go, your presence is with me. In the womb of my mother, I was being knit together by you. You are with me. Listen, friends. God is with you wherever you go. Start practicing, talking to him. And you'll slowly find that reigniting is happening. You'll start finding that fire starts to begin to get lit in your life. Okay, a couple more pieces of advice. Um, down in verse, okay, uh, down in verse four, he says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. And you notice this, this language, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. The writers are talking about going to a worship service, praying with, worshiping with other believers. And this reminds me of a very significant thing that you can do if your prayer life has died out. That is to pray with other people in life group. Um, pray with other people on, 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 a, on a morning. Call up a friend and say, hey, can we pray every day together at 630 or can we meet someplace at Panera and pray together? Get, you pray with your spouse. Pray with your kids. Pray with people who are a lot more mature than you are. Find people to pray with. Because something happens when we pray with other people. Again, if you're a brand new prayer, you're just brand new to this whole thing, you can learn to pray by hearing the prayers of other people. In fact, it's one of the best ways to learn to pray is to pray with others. You're intimidated about saying something in front of these people? Listen to what this person says. 
Um, and again, if, if you're an older believer, you're a seasoned believer, and a younger believer wants to pray with you, please, by all means, do not pray those stinking flowery prayers. Be, be simple. You're modeling. Be simple. Be real. Be, just let it flow. And by pr- praying with others, you hear how they often pray the names of God. Or they, they pray the scriptures. And you keep going, ooh, whenever I pray with her or with him, they're always praying the scriptures. Now, sometimes you might hear that some people have a habit of saying, you know, oh, Father, I have an old Lord, Father, we're so, so glad, Father, we're here, Father, together, together, Father. And I think it's so, Father, it's such a beautiful day, Father. And I thank you, Father, for the word. And, you know, this, everything's Father or everything is God, you know. So don't follow those people. That's, usually that happens because a person's uncomfortable in prayer. Um, prayer is just talking to God. And if you are wanting to be discipled by somebody else, then just go up to a believer. Go up to somebody that you respect and say, hey, can you, can you disciple me? Can you teach me how to pray? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. This, this, is, what, this is how we grow, one-on-one, praying with each other. And you learn how to, to pray. You learn how to form words that just are all sometimes jumbled up inside of you. And the words begin to flow. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's what I encourage you to pray with other people. Yes, I can. I just did. Okay, one more thing. Notice in verse 4, these things I remember. Down again at verse 6. Therefore, I will remember you. So the last thing I want you to write down, or last point, is this, this word remember, because it's such a catalytic word. It's such a incendiary word. That's a good word. It's, a, it's an igniting word. When you remember the faithfulness of God, it ignites something inside of you. You remember and you recite the way that God met your need, the way God answered a prayer last week, yesterday, two weeks ago, a year ago, you know, the time you were so afraid. And, oh, yeah, you cried out and God answered. Remember that. Don't forget the things that God has done. This is, a, this is something that you see happening again and again. I think the first time you see it is in Deuteronomy where Moses says to the Israelites, now don't forget, you're about to go into the, the promised land. Don't forget what God's done for you again and again. Remember, remember, remember. Why? Because remembering re- brings us back to that moment, those feelings, that remembering what God did, and it gives us faith to believe that God's hearing me now. Um, when, you know, when I talked at the beginning of the sermon about the Igniting Prayer series we started two years ago, we invited you at the beginning of that series, throughout that series, to uh, go to the prayer wall. We created a prayer wall at every single campus. And we said, you know, write down your prayers on this little piece of paper. One side says ignite, present your request to God based on Philippians 4, 6. The other side, many of you remember this, was a, an open space for you to, to write your prayer out to God. To, um, to, to write out with words what you were feeling. And we invite you to, to roll it up tightly and then slide it into the, little, the mesh at each, each prayer wall. Maybe you didn't know that existed. You could have one on each campus. And I was inspired by this when I went to Israel and saw the, the western wall of the, the Temple Mount, sometimes called the Wailing Wall. And uh, what people have done over the you know, hundreds of years is they've, they've taken pieces of paper and they've written a prayer and then they fold it up into tiny little squares or they roll it up and they've stuffed it into the cracks of the western wall. So you walk up there and you're at the Temple Mount and there's all these little pieces of paper stuck in the cracks and I'm like, we need to have a prayer wall at Church of the Open Door. So we came back and I gave it to our, t- our artistic guys and they came up with the mesh and everything. And we encourage you to do that. And many of you have done that. Uh, they're not meant to be pulled out and read. They're confidential prayers. Once you put it in there, you know, our staff does not pull them out and read them. That's between you and God. Now, do you have to write out the prayer and put it in the prayer wall? No. It's not like God's going to say, well, I didn't hear you because you didn't write it down. No. It's just, it's just a physical Reminder that I was inspired by the praying at the Western Wall that we could do. And recently, our prayer team said, hey, how come there's no way to um, record answered prayers? And I'm like, that's a really good, good question. So they came up with little red sheets. 
So when you want to write out a praise to God or just, you know, thanks to God for the answer prayer, go grab the red sheet. Again, they're now at every prayer wall. And write down an answered prayer. Write down a praise to God. Here's what their, their vision was, which I just love and I'm, I'm embracing it, is that eventually we have all kinds of red and white mixed up. So it's just a picture of requests made to God and answers that God's given. Isn't that a cool idea, that collage of red and white? To remind us to talk to God, to bring our requests, to remind us that God answers prayer. To remember it's such an important word. Remember what God said, what God did. And friends, if you'll spend some time with this, every one of you can remember some things that God's done in your life that he's been so faithful. And that'll help stoke that fire. That'll help ignite that fire. I, I challenge you. Get a prayer journal. Does anybody keep a prayer journal? Write down your prayers and then review them. To help you remember. So like the psalmist who says, then I remembered you. Now there was a famous person who loved to help people remember. There was one particular night that this famous person was sitting at a meal with his 12 friends and said to them, remember. Whenever you have this meal, remember me. Who was that? That was Jesus picked up that remembering theme, and with his disciples, the night before he died, when they're remembering at Passover meal, remembering and recounting the mighty works of God in the Exodus, Jesus infuses new meaning into that Passover meal and says this, bod, this bread represents my body. Many of you know this. He said this bread represents my body broken for you, and this cup represents my blood shed for you. And then he said these words, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. Anybody um, remember going to a church where they had, do this in remembrance of me, stamped on the altar in front or a communion table? That's where that comes from. Remember. So let me challenge you. Remember the cross. This is the greatest thing to remember. This is the greatest thing that in history, when God purchased our salvation, brought us into relationship, made it possible for us to be in relationship by sending his own son, not just to love on us, not just to teach us, not just to model how to walk with God, but to actually die on the cross so we could be reconciled with God, so our, our sins could be atoned for. There's so many things that that God did for us at the cross, reconciliation, atonement, um, redemption, bringing, making it possible for us to be adopted into God's family. All this happened at the cross. So remember the cross. If you don't remember anything else that God's done, remember the cross and write this down. Remembering what Christ did for us often reignites grateful passion, amen, in us. So maybe that's what you need right now is to go back to the cross. Let's do that. Let's go back to the cross. Let's remember the mighty work of God. Let's remember that all of us are lost apart from the cross, that nobody seeks God on their own. The only people that seek God are the ones who, that, you know, the only ones that seek God are the, is when God gives us the grace to respond to him, which he does to everybody, common grace. Everybody has the grace to respond back to God. And that grace is now at work in you to respond, to pray, to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your body broken for me. Thank you for your blood shed for me for the forgiveness of sins. And God, do a work in my heart. Light a fire in my soul. This past week, uh, uh, yeah, just two days ago, I invited our whole church staff to come to my house for a, a worship uh, and prayer night. It was awesome. And um, we're worshiping away, praying away, and all of a sudden one person started singing, set a fire down in my soul. Uh, set a fire down my soul, a, a fire that I can't contain and I, and I can't control. Lord, I want more of you. 
more of you. And, I'm, and I picked up on that song and everyone's pretty soon the whole room is, we're just, we're belting it out. We're crying out like Psalm 42. We're crying out, set a fire down in my soul. A fire that I can't contain, that I can't control. God, fire, oh God, fall on us. And if you'll ask God, if you'll cry out to him, God, it's not enough that you just tell me what you've done. I want you to make it real in my life. I don't want to recount the cross as just a historical story. I want it to be real for me. Let the fire fall. Let your spirit come and make real that I can remember again what happened at the cross. And then when we take communion, it's not just a ritual of bread and cup. It's remembering what he did on the cross and asking him, oh God, light a fire in my soul. When I was a worship leader years and years ago, one of my favorite songs was a song called Light the Fire Again. And I've been singing that song this week. God, my, my prayers sometimes get cold. Sometimes my heart gets hard. But light a fire again in my soul. Is that your prayer this morning? That you would just cry out to God, God, God light a fire in me. Do something in me that I cannot do. This is not you working something up. This is you crying out to God and God falling upon you. His fire coming and making real what happened on the cross. Making real the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Articulating, giving you words to praise him as you read the Psalms, as you pray the Psalms, as you cry out to God. Amen? This is what I want for you. Let's all close our eyes. God, I, I just pray right now for all of us in every campus. I cry out. As, as lead pastor of this church, I cry out to you for Church of the Open Door. God, revive us, ignite in us, reignite in us a passion for you, a passion for prayer, a passion for connecting with you. And, and God, just break the strongholds of religion. Break the, the rituals of just going through the motions and instead set us free, ignite in us such a hunger for you, a yearning for you, a passion for you, that we can't help it, but we just like the psalmists cry out, my soul thirsts for you. I want more of you. So Lord Jesus, the one who died for our sins, the one who said the Holy Spirit's coming and he will, he will be a fire, a refining fire in you. Lord Jesus, Release the Holy Spirit upon us even now to uh, once again give us words to say, to once again remind us of our salvation, to once again remind us of the great work that you've done, and to help us articulate our praise to you. And if there's anyone here today who has never given their life to Christ, they've never cried out, Lord, right now, this moment, may they just say, God, save me. I, I want what he's talking about. I want that kind of relationship. I want that kind of forgiveness of sins. I, I, will, I will leave my life of self-centeredness. I will stop acting as if I'm in charge and I will turn to you. I will surrender my life to you. Lead me, save me, fill me. I'm yours. That's prayer. That's prayer. And God, for every prayer that's voiced, spoken and unspoken this morning, hear the prayers of your people. As we come to your table, Lord Jesus, we come trembling at the holiness of this moment, at the privilege we have of talking with, addressing, coming boldly into the throne of grace, in the presence of the holy, transcendent, living God. Meet us at the table, Lord, even as you are meeting us in this moment. For we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.